All right. Well, I'm grateful to be here, and I'll, by way of disclosure, I don't have any financial disclosures that I'm supposed to tell anybody about. Oops, let's see if this works. Um, I'm going to talk about exercises, but more so habits that can help prevent and treat emotional disorders. And I'm not a therapist, I'm not a mental health expert, I'm a family medicine physician, as Dr. Sharman said, but I do spend a lot of time with patients that have emotional and other mental disorders. I work at Weber Human Services as their medical director, and we take care of patients in Weber and Ogden County, or excuse me, Weber and Morgan County, that have mental health and substance use disorders. And so it's something we see a lot of. I'm here because a year ago, I was attending an event at the School of Addiction Recovery here in Ogden, and they're a recovery gym that works with patients that have substance use disorders. And I made a comment about some similarities between their philosophies and some of the psychotherapy that we provide at Weber Human Services. And it just so happened that Dr. Sharman was in attendance and heard that comment, and hence, here I am. So the moral of the story is don't open your mouth. And all joking aside, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about these things, but I want to admit that none of these ideas are new. I'm going to advocate that we consider how we use media, mindfulness, and motion in our lives and how we recommend that to our patients. But what might be different than what you typically hear is how the, some of the information and theories out there can support those activities, specifically the Unified Protocol for the Transdiagnostic Treatment of Emotional Disorders and the theory of constructed emotion. So this theory of constructed emotion uh, was developed by this brilliant person. This is Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, and she is a neuroscientist and psychologist who developed this theory, and she holds appointments at prestigious places. Um, but as strongly as I know how, I would recommend picking up her book, Seven and a Half Lessons on the Brain. It's written for the lay public, but it's fascinating, and I'm going to unabashedly steal a lot of her ideas uh, going forward. Dr. Baird asserts that brains didn't develop for thinking, actually. Instead, brains developed because we needed to predict. Millions of years ago, theoretically, organisms like Amphioxus here didn't require a very complex nervous system because they didn't need to do much. But during the Cambrian period, supposedly, predators came on the scene, and it became advantageous to be able to move quickly and to be able to predict, is that thing going to eat me or can I eat it? But to make those types of predictions and manage increasingly complex bodies, a more complex nervous system was necessary. And, a nervous, and that was a nervous system and a brain that could analyze current body resources and predict the cost on those resources to execute actions. That process is called allostasis. And Dr. Barrett asserts that at any given moment, each of us is getting a report, an allostatic, allostatic summary of where our resources stand. We can be either high or low in energy and, and experience kind of an unpleasant or, or a pleasant sensation based off what our body is predicting is going to happen and where our resources sit. But this isn't emotion. According to Dr. Barrett, emotion instead is a guess, one of many types of guesses. Let's get this out so I can see my slides. One of many types of guesses that our body makes to ascertain meaning from current external and internal stimuli. Our body's comparing that pattern of neuronal activity to our past experiences and then making a prediction about what is likely to happen next and what should I do about it. This happens so quickly that it almost feels like it's something that is done to us, but in fact, emotions are made by us. And these emotions serve a really important purpose. They notify us and help make us and others aware of important things that are happening internally and externally and they help prepare us and motivate us to act in response to that. This is different than the way that emotions have been thought of in times past. For example, if someone encounters a snake, it was thought previously that some type of involuntary fear circuit would be tripped in the brain, and that would produce this reflexive response that was ubiquitous among human beings and universal, resulting in patterns of movement and facial expressions that could be identified from one race and one culture to another. This was based on, in part, this idea of a triune brain, kind of like a three-layer cake, wherein a survival system developed originally involving our brain stem and basal ganglia, and then an evolutionarily newer layer of limbic system 
for emotions came on board. And then finally, a new or neocortex capped it off and gave us the prize as best species because our neocortex was able to control the underlying lizard brain. And someone who behaved in that fashion was considered rational, whereas someone who chose not to do that was immoral, and someone who was unable to do that was thought to have mental illness. The problem with this idea is that as science progressed, it was discovered that the genes for each of those different parts of the brain are actually present in essentially all vertebrates. And there's other data that refuted this idea as well. But if mental illness isn't a problem with our neocortex controlling this uh, subcortical lizard brain, perhaps mental illness could be looked at a problem with, as a problem with allostasis, an inability of our brain to make predictions that were accurate or helpful. And in describing the structure of the brain, it can be helpful to consider it as a network rather than kind of the tri-layer or the three-layer cake like we talked about before. Instead, it's kind of like a global air travel uh, system. There's like there's thousands, just like there's thousands of airports, but some behave differently. LAX is different than Salt Lake City because of the amount of activity that occurs there. And our brain with its 128 billion uh, neurons and 500 trillion plus connections has some hubs, some collections of neurons that are more active than others. And this is a flexible system. It can change because of neurotransmitter activity, and that can happen quick, just like airport staff can alter the activity in the airport really fast. There can be longer-term remodeling type changes that can happen with plasticity. Neurons that fire frequently are going to undergo myelination and synaptogenesis. They're going to make more connections. Alternatively, neurons that fire less frequently are going to be pruned and undergo the opposite effects. Additionally, Flexibility is increased because of the degeneracy of the, nervous, of the central nervous system. If I raise my right hand and then I do it again, it's improbable that that happened the same way twice. Different neurons can do, serve different functions and be repurposed. So that's a lot of words to say. There's a ton of complexity built into the brain. And there's an essentially innumerable number of patterns of neuronal activity that can be generated. And these are important because our brain doesn't store memories like files in a computer system. Memories and behaviors are each comprised of different patterns of neural activity that are happening. And to illustrate the amount of patterns that can be generated by the brain, Dr. Barrett uses the example of a 14-tool pocket knife. And if you had a 14-tool pocket knife that could be either opened or closed, then theoretically there would be about 2 to the 14th power number of possibilities. That's about 16,000. You add a 15th tool, now you can have 32,000 possibilities. You say that the pocket knife can be open, closed, or partially opened, now you have over four million. So just for fun, I looked up the supposed span of the known universe that's thought to be 93 billion light years across. And it's supposedly low density with about one hydrogen atom per four cubic meters. If that's the case, that would mean that there's about two to the 266th power atoms in the observable universe. And yet, a human brain with 128 billion neurons, if we erroneously assume that they could only be active or inactive, and that's not true. They're always on, and there's different uh, uh, graded action potentials. But even if there were only two options, that would mean that, you know, theoretically, we could generate two to the 128 billionth power different patterns of neuronal activity. So could we have a pattern or a memory for every single atom in the universe? I don't know. <laughs> but it's amazing how complex the three, matter, the three pounds of gray matter between our ears is. But it doesn't start out ready to go. Our brains are born under development and don't mature until around age 25. And the, our brains will be altered in their development depending on what sounds, shapes, words uh, they're exposed to. And over time, that brain, that baby brain, will learn that this pattern of sounds, smells, touches is my mother, and that's the cat. And that takes time to develop, and it takes that firing together and wiring together that synaptogenesis and myelination. And over time, the, that baby brain learns allostasis. It learns to predict what's going to happen or what's likely to happen and what it's going to cost their body to do that. It learns to focus its attention and exclude other stimuli. It learns what combinations of senses mean. And this is good because we don't have to ingrain all that into our DNA every time a baby's born, and a baby can adapt to its world circumstances, which may be different than its ancestors. But it comes at a price. The risk of this is that if babies don't get appropriate stimulation, their brains don't develop the way they should. 
This was exemplified in Romania in the 1960s when a communist government outlawed contraception and thousands of infants were born and warehoused uh, with very little human interaction and their brains didn't develop normally. So as humans, ours is such that our nature requires nurture. So our brain sits in this, and there's another problem, our brain sits in this dark box trying to guess what do these changes in air pressure and light and sound mean? And fortunately, it can compare current stimuli to past patterns of neuronal activity and make a guess about what that means. But it also then alters our sensory input, or our, our uh, sensory experiences based off of what it thinks is going to happen. Dr. Barrett received a letter once from a man from South Africa who in the 1970s during apartheid was involuntarily conscripted into uh, the army. And he was tasked with searching the jungle for enemy soldiers. And one day he found just that a line of enemy soldiers led by a man with a machine gun. And in response, he raised his own uh, firearm, flipped off the safety, and right before he shot the enemy, his friend stopped him and said, wait, don't shoot the boy. And to his horror, he saw that there wasn't a line of enemy soldiers. In fact, there was a young boy with a stick leading a, a line of cows. So how can this happen? If we look at this, situ or this situation here, your brain and mine tries to analyze that and go, what does this mean? What's happening? And it's struggling to make a prediction because of lack of experience. You give it some context, and now all of a sudden, our neurons that are associated with previous memories of witches' hats and water and, and ships turn on. Same thing, if you haven't seen this picture before, the brain says, what is this, what is this, what is this, what is this? You give it a little bit more information, and now all of a sudden neurons associated with our memories of snakes are firing. Did the picture change? No, but we did. And every time we experience anything, it changes us. It makes us different. It alters our future predictions. And this happens in more ways than, than just uh, linking our memories or experiences to snake neurons. I don't know if I can get this to play here. So, all of us have experience with big things. But if something were really that big and moving like that, and we're able and we're to cause things to shake, we would often feel it. And many people, when they see a video like this, they'll, feel, they'll actually feel kind of a thud in their chest or even in their ears when they, when they see that happen. In medical school, we were taught about the blind spot where the optic nerve exits the retina and there's no photoreceptors there. So if you hold a piece of paper with a picture like this about 12 inches from your face, and close one eye and look at the opposite image, that cross will disappear and your brain will fill it in with green or yellow on the other side. Your brain will totally make it up based off what it expects to be there. And this happens every second of every hour of every day. Our brain just makes up what it thinks we should see. Another example. We all learned about Pavlov's dogs. And yes, he won the Nobel Prize and we learned about classical conditioning, but what, what also happened here was the brains of the dogs learned to make different predictions and produced efferent responses in the bodies of those animals based off what the brain thought was going to happen. Lastly, on this topic, our brains can also shut off and ignore sensory input if it decides it's not important. Each of us have had the experience of being thirsty, drinking water, and then feeling an immediate uh, satiation. But that water doesn't hit our bloodstream for oftentimes several minutes. And yet, the brain, how does that happen? It's because of prediction. We've uh, experienced drinking water enough times to know that it's going to be OK. That water's going to come. So the brain will ignore subsequent input saying that we're thirsty because it knows we're not going to be. So when our predictions are right, our brain constructs our reality. When our predictions are wrong, our brain still constructs our reality and can ignore or alter sensory data in the process. So, that's kind of a scary situation, because that, does that mean we're doomed to think or feel or see or slobber uh, like Pavlov's dogs based off of our past experience? And what if our predictions are wrong? What if, in particular, our predictions about it, which emotions are helpful or necessary in a situation are wrong? Can we do anything about it? And that moves us to the unified protocol. This is a type of psychotherapy uh, that takes place over weekly sessions for about 12 to 16 weeks. And it's designed to help those with emotional disorders things like anxiety, depression, um, and also related disorders, borderline, bipolar, PTSD, substance use disorder, have also shown benefit with this type of treatment. It's evidence-based off of uh, other types of therapy, including motivational interviewing, CBT, acceptance and commitment therapy. There have been randomized trials that have uh, 
show the efficacy and endurance of the benefits of this type of treatment. And it's transdiagnostic in the sense that it's been noted that patients with mental illness have oftentimes comorbid mental illnesses. Anxiety and depression commonly occur together, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, etc. And interestingly, if you treat one of them, the others seem to improve as well. And that begs the question, well then, is there some type of underlying similarity or shared uh, vulnerabilities between them? And the argument of the unified protocol is that yes, there is. Every emotional disorder has some similar parts. One, these people experience frequent, intense, negative emotions. And each of those emotions has three parts. Thoughts and physical sensations that, for lack of a more eloquent term, suck. It feels uncomfortable when your heart's beating out of your chest and you're sweating. It's scary. Or, if you, or those thoughts of, this is going to turn out badly, I'm going to fail, maybe I'm going to die. And these thoughts and physical sensations are so uncomfortable that patients then engage in an avoidant behavior. They do anything to get away from it. And the problem with these avoidant behaviors is that they perpetuate the problem. Because if, for example, someone's in, experience a negative emotion, experiencing a negative emotion, and they use heroin, in the short term, it fixes it. The thoughts and physical sensations go away. But in the long term, they're in trouble. Because the next time they get in that situation, their brain's going to analyze current external and t internal data, compare that to their past experiences, and go, hey, the last time we were in a situation like this, we used heroin, and we're alive, so that obviously worked, so let's do that again. And it's going to pr base its predictions off of those past experiences and reinforce previously unhelpful predictions. So the Unified Protocol doesn't seek to help comfort people in the moment. Instead, it ex helps patients learn to endure uncomfortable physical sensations and thoughts and choose alternative actions instead. And so those are some of the core skills that the Unified Protocol helps develop, um, specifically looking at thoughts and learning to avoid delving into the present or into the past or in the future or overestimating or catastrophizing the likelihood or severity of bad things happening. They learn to, again, endure physical discomfort and choose an alternative action that's harder in the short term but more effective in the long term. So lastly, how does this relate to habits of media, mindfulness, and motion? These habits can help change future emotions if patients and ourselves conscientiously engage with our thoughts, our physical sensations, and the behaviors associated with the emotions that we experience. So first, media. We've talked about how predictions precede confirmatory sensory input. Once the brain's decided something's going to happen, it's going to alter our sensations. It's going to carry out that prediction to a large degree. And our predictions depend on past experiences. So we're hosed. What are we going to do? I can't change my current emotions. But what we can do is we can alter future predictions based off what we allow our brains to be exposed to now. That will alter the wiring of our brain and our reality. We all know this with kids, and there's lots of data to show that kids exposed to violent media are more likely to engage in violence. They're, they become more callous. Uh, there's data to show that social media is harmful to children, so much so that the Surgeon General recently, recently raised the alarm about how the mental health of young people is affected by the social media that they're exposed to. Their brains predict differently when they're exposed to this stuff. But what about ourselves, and what about our patients? If our brains and our minds are exposed to pornography, angry political commentary, sensational news, violent music lyrics or movies or video games or whatever, what are our brains going to expect to see in the world around us? What are they going to predict? What type of sensory information might they prioritize or create? Also, how does it affect our capacity to pay attention? If we're hopping from one thing to another, from this icon to this buzzing, beeping, flashing thing, after a while, our brain starts to learn that, hey, I've been at this too long. I've got to switch. And this has gotten to the point that many of you have probably seen articles. When you read at the beginning, it says, hey, man, this is only going to take six minutes. This is a six-minute read. So I'm warning you up front, like, buckle down. We can get through it. And even would-be influencers on social media sites could find tables like this that say, if you're going to reach somebody, you've only got this many seconds, and you're going to lose them because of the effects of media on our attention span. So what do you do about it? There's lots of conscientious strategies we could employ to manage our use of media. I like that rec the one recommended by C.S. Lewis, who argues that each generation and individual is susceptible to their own version of blindness. And the only remedy that he found in his life that he thought was effective was what, to keep what he called the clean breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds. And his method of obtaining that breeze was old books. 
And how would the world be different if, like Socrates, we had the humility to say, you know, the only thing I really know for certain is that I don't know anything. Or the wisdom of Marcus Aurelius, who slept in the, in the dirt with his soldiers, even though he was the emperor of Rome, and said that, you know what, how I look at things is going to taint my, it's going to affect my experience. What thoughts I choose to embrace is going to alter my reality. Or the grit of Cyrus the Great, king of Persia, who realized that just because something's hard doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. And he taught that soft countries give birth to soft men. So we've all done things, involunt or voluntary things, to try to adopt automaticity in our lives. We've learned to tie our shoes. We've learned to drive cars. Um, but it's also important to realize that those activities, those thoughts, those behaviors that we engage in frequently, whether we intend to or not, will become part of us. We will become what we do. And we can't engage in anything with impunity because it changes who we are and what we are. So we can and should be conscientious about what we expose our brains to. Next, I've got five minutes. Um, mindfulness. So this was introduced to me by my friend Brent Blaisdell uh, during, during residency. And to be honest, I was rude about it. I remember saying, Brent, so you're telling me you want me to just sit here and pay attention to my breath. That's your plan? How is that going to help me? I've got so much stuff to do. Why do you, like, what is the use of this? And I subsequently came across some, some data that showed that people who engaged in mindfulness consistently actually had detectable changes on imaging in their brain. And that made me stop and think, well, if it alters anatomy, something has to happen. And so I'm not an expert in it by any means, but it's something that I have investigated further. And I particularly like the way that it's taught in the Unified Protocol, wherein therapists will teach patients to just spend five minutes a day and sit on a chair. You don't have to be out in the grass or cross-legged or anything, but just sit on a chair with your hands on your lap, with your eyes closed, and pay attention to where you are. Imagine the room, feel the chair beneath you, the floor beneath your feet, and get grounded here. Then focus your awareness on your breath, coming in, coming out, and focus and ground in the now. And once you're here and once you're now, now focus your awareness on your bodily sensations. There might be an itch, there might be pain, there might be an ache, but it's interesting that it comes and goes. And try not to get tangled up with it, just watch it. After you've done that for a, for a while, next move to your thoughts. Notice that they come, that they go. Um, if you catch yourself getting preoccupied with the future or the past or catastrophizing or overestimating bad things, come back to the present. Focus on your breath again and just watch and see and observe. And then when they're ready, they go back to paying attention to the feeling of the chair, ground themselves back in the room, open their eyes, and they're done. But this is applicable because in day-to-day -day life, when we start to feel emotions escalate and we're given that I'm ready to strangle somebody feeling, we can employ those same skills. So in those, in those moments of escalating emotion, we can stop, we can feel the floor beneath our feet, we can uh, notice the breath in our nostrils, we can come back to the here and now, and then we can stop and say, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What behavior am I engaged in or thinking about engaging in? And is that helpful? Is that what's most appropriate for this situation? And if not, we can rein ourselves back in and choose an alternative action instead. This happened to me the other day when I was taking my youngest kids to go get some food, and my 10-year-old proceeded to spill mine on the car floor three different times before we got home, and I was so bugged, and I had to, but I had to stop, feel the floor underneath my feet, and pay attention to my breath for just a moment, and go, whoa, 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 whoa. What, am I, what am I thinking, what am I feeling, what am I doing? And I realized I'm really hungry, and I'm really tired, but this isn't the end of the world, and rein myself back in, and just little things like that can be easier when we've practiced this, it's also been shown to, you know, reframing our thoughts can help us in all kinds of situations, whether it's test anxiety with students or any situation where most emotions escalate. Additionally, mindfulness can help us with our attention. We can learn to, if we can make ourselves pay attention to our breathing or our physical sensations or our thoughts, we can practice putting our attention where we mean it to be. And people who practice mindfulness consistently have been shown to be able to do just that, and also to avoid paying attention to things that aren't helpful, like pain. And people who do this frequently are better able to manage and even report experiencing less perceivable pain. So like elementary school kids, we can learn to stop and think and go through the regular habit or exercise or practice of mindfulness. And lastly, movement. I'm here because I made this comment a year ago. When we were at the School of Addiction Recovery, I mentioned that I thought it was impressive that 
their practice of using exercises with sets, so high intensity interval training, barbell training, allowed patients to work on those core skills. They were allowed to feel things that are uncomfortable, thoughts and physical sensations that suck, and stick with it, and then choose to do it again, and again, and again, and again, to choose an alternative action instead of an avoidant behavior, to address physical thoughts and, and or physical sensations and thoughts, and help their brain realize, if you're trying to make a prediction, this isn't indicative of me dying, because we've done it again, and again, and again. High intensity interval training is essentially just sprinting for 30 seconds with a bike or running or whatever, and then coming off for 30 seconds to a minute, back and forth, back and forth. Barbell training is going to do the same thing. It's going to allow us to do sets where we exert ourselves, we experience physical discomfort, and then we back off. If you look in the up-to-date monograph for strength training, they particularly recommend barbells because they replicate normal human motion and aren't limited to the uh, mechanics of a machine. It can fit that person's anatomy perfectly, and you can move a large amount of muscle in a small amount of time with a few exercises. And specifically, some of the most effective ones are a barbell bench press, a deadlift, a press, and a standing press, and a squat. And there's lots of information out there how to do these. Up to date has pictures and images of, of how to perform these exercises. But the best one that I've found is the Starting Strength book and the Starting Strength app. And if you're looking for something to get started or you want to recommend something to your patients, buy that. The app is about 30 bucks, but it's fantastic. It'll show, show patients where to put their hands, where to breathe, where to put the, the barbell. It's, it's very good. Or if you have older patients, um, and want some specific information to help them, the barbell prescription is another fantastic uh, resource, and that's, a, and that's a book. So in closing, uh, wrapping up here, if someone wants to do this, a good place to start, do three or four of those main lifts, do them two or three times a week, do three sets of five, and that's a great place to start. There's lots of misconceptions. These are listed on up-to-date about weight training, that Valsalva is dangerous, it's gonna hurt uncomplicated pregnancy or be unsafe for children, it's not. And it helps, oste it helps arthritis, it helps our tension, uh, excuse me, hypertension and mobility problems, and it's not going to make females look like the Hulk. It's a lot safer than activities that we normally suggest for people. And anybody who can walk and safely engage in other types of exercise can do this. And so these are some of the videos that they have on, on up to date, show, kind of exemplifying this, and it just kind of gives you an example. But in summary, our emotions can be seen as predictions, and they're constructed by our external and internal, our past and present, and voluntary and involuntary experiences. And they alter our senses and construct our reality, and they might be wrong, but we can alter our future emotions, we can alter our future predictions by the way that we engage with the thoughts, physical sensations, and behaviors associated with our emotions in the present and consist consistent and conscientious media, mindfulness, and movement can help us do that. So we see what we seek, we become what we do, and sometimes we're responsible for things because, not because they're our fault, but because we're the only ones who can change them. So, thank you. <laughs>